Well, good evening and welcome everyone to night seven of Plenary Tracker, bringing you news and insights from the Plenary Council from the Australasian Catholic Coalition for Church Reform and Concerned Catholics, Canberra Goulburn. My name's Genevieve Jacobs with you tonight from the lands of the Wiradjuri people, whose elders and traditional ownership I acknowledge and the elders of the places from whence you join us. We've had a terrific run of plenary trackers, all intended to get people talking about the major church issues that are and, and perhaps aren't part of council proceedings. Please post your questions in the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen through our moderator, Tracy McEwen tonight. Let's have respectful engagement. Let's have questions that take us somewhere useful, be robust, be critical, ask something meaningful. I've also been asked tonight to say, keep them a little bit brief too concise so that Tracy can weed through those. James is our technical administrator. You can message him through the Q&A screen if you're experiencing any difficulties. Tonight we'll talk about the inclusion and exclusion of LGBTQIA plus Catholics, what some call the rainbow community. But first, here's the news. The formal session of the Plenary Council's First Assembly ended today. It now remains for the proposals arising from the discernment sessions to be published and for Archbishop Mark Coleridge, an instigator of the whole process, to celebrate the closing mass tomorrow morning. John Warhurst in his blog quotes one member saying, we remain a house divided. Nevertheless, the chair of Concerned Catholics, Canberra Goulburn, believes the broader impact on the church in Australia is incalculable. Women were present and though in a minority made their voices heard, Virginia Burke from Mercy Health urged the Catholic Church to listen to the insights of the people of God and learn from them, including from Indigenous people and the LGBTIQA plus community. She said, we need to be in dialogue with the world, not in opposition to it. Francis Sullivan in his blog says we should take heart because the drumbeats of change are echoing through the Plenary Council. But he says, the attitude and culture of our church appears to be based on an outdated understanding of personhood, which has not kept pace with developments in the human sciences. And this has a negative impact on the understandings of sexuality, gender diversity and identity, and in the end, excludes many from the life of the church. Let's go now to our first guest this evening. Our plenary council member today is Claire Victory. Claire is national president of the St. Vincent de Paul Society. She works as a solicitor and lives on Ghana land in Adelaide. Claire, welcome. Wonderful to have you with us. I think you're on mute, Claire. <laughs> the words of 2021. Yeah, I was just going to say that's the motto of the plenary, really. You're on mute. Um, you'd think by, by now we'd have learned, but no, thank you for having me. Claire, the final day of the First Assembly, this enormous process has just taken place. Talk to us about today's proceedings, how deliberations have unfolded over the past week from your perspective. Yeah, um, it's it's been interesting. Um, there was this sort of mad rush yesterday afternoon to get our proposals drafted in our small groups. Uh, I think we sort of assumed that would maybe be happening or being finalised today, but instead it was yesterday afternoon. We did thankfully get some time uh, this afternoon to work on those proposals a little bit further, um, uh, but we didn't sort of then present them back to the group or anything like that. Those are now with the, the drafting group to, to turn into something um, after this first assembly. So there's this weird sense of, uh, have we done enough to capture what it is that we were uh, discussing, um, you know, to, to give to that drafting committee so that they can come up with the right sort of proposals uh, in the lead up to the next assembly. There's been a, an interesting ebb and flow in the dynamics throughout the council. We started with people feeling anxious, but often very optimistic, really hopeful. Yep. A little bit of a sense through the middle, are we really getting anywhere? Is this all going to come up with something purposeful or meaningful in the end? How are you feeling having landed at this point of the deliberations concluding? Yeah, it was definitely a real roller coaster. Um, I sort of tried to note down at the end of each day how I was feeling and it went from, oh, this process is actually getting us somewhere to then the next day going, hang on, we're back to further behind where we were yesterday. How did that happen? Um, so there's a bit of sort of frustration and uncertainty in that. Um, look, I, I feel confident that a lot of good things have been captured. I probably don't feel that the concrete proposals came out of the week that I had assumed would be aiming for. Again, I think some small groups did a better job of that, of coming up with some quite concrete um, 
things that, that we can do going forward, whereas some seem to have general statements which uh, seem to be not even as developed as a lot of the sort of uh, submissions that had come out, you know, beforehand from different groups. So, you know, I'm feeling that the process has been worthwhile, some of the conversations, the relationship building has been a really positive thing in and of itself. Um, but I am also from the privileged position of being with others here in Adelaide, not doing this from the isolation of my bedroom. Uh, and I, I really feel for those who've experienced the last week in that isolated state, because that would have been incredibly challenging. Well, I, you're with us from Archbishop's house with that rather sumptuous backdrop. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and Claire, um, is it your sense that those 17,500 submissions, that remarkable range of submissions have been respected that they've been taken with all the integrity and thought and and great passion with which they were presented i feel that they were present in the plenary through the voices of a number of members uh i'm not so confident that the agenda properly captured them in a way that then enabled the small groups to really sort of sink their teeth in and, and get some concrete proposals. Um, but yeah, so I think the voices came through. I'm I'm not entirely confident that um, the agenda or the process was such that we could really do justice to the submissions, um, but I'm hoping that somehow by the end of the second assembly, those submissions will have been, uh, uh, yeah, become more, um, will have materialised in some way a bit more than, than, than I feel they have at the moment. So we hold, on to that that way. We, we hold on to that hope because there is, yep. of course, a whole second assembly to yep. come. Claire, throughout this plenary tracker process, each night we've been talking often about inclusion, about speaking for and to all the baptised with words that reach everyone and are intended to capture everyone. Tell me your thoughts around how the language of the church sets this idea of inclusion up. Uh, look, that's... That's an interesting question. Um, the, the concept of inclusion has been, I think, sort of ever present in the day's proceedings through the interventions that people have made and uh, probably to varying extents in the different small groups. Um, the question of language uh, has has come up a couple of times. Um, I, I'm not aware of it being very sort of well developed in terms of the conversations people have had. And really that's because a lot of these ideas and concerns come through strongly in the interventions, but we don't then have discussion based on those interventions. We have discussion in our small groups in a very particular process that we follow based on the one, or in my, my case, two questions that our group has been given. Mm. Um, so it's, um, it's, it's really hard to see whether that question or that issue has really been addressed to any great extent, other than through individual, individual members putting it on the record through their interventions. Mm. I mean, what's your thought about inclusive language more generally in the church? Um, look, I think that is um, that would be a very easy, uh, very um, in the scheme of things, small thing that we could do immediately to uh, be a lot more inclusive and welcoming immediately. Um, and a couple of people have made that point, um, but. Again, uh, even something as, as seemingly small but significant as that, I don't feel has really come out through the proposals, at least not what I've seen of them. But again, some further work was done on those things today that I might not be privy to because they didn't happen in my small group. Mm. And, and, and again, I think more broadly with reference to the church as a whole and, and not only the deliberations of the plenary council, in a real sense, our language forecasts who we are, how inclusive our approach to others is. 
tell me about modeling welcome. What, what do you mean when you talk about modeling welcome? Well, I think uh, language and the way that we talk to and about people is, is part of that. Um, I also think, um, you know, the way that we act towards each other um, should really be a signal of uh, how we act to other people in the world and the extent to which we, we welcome people. And, you know, I... I often sort of have a, a, a concern or a difficulty with the fact that, you know, people who are Catholic and part of the church can, you know, talk about how we need to welcome people and welcome the oppressed and welcome the margins, welcome people on the margins um, when they're talking about other people and, you know, people living in poverty and through our good works, we need to include and welcome people and treat people with dignity but then we don't actually uh, model that same behaviour to the person next to us in a pew or across the table uh, at a meeting through through church bodies and those sorts of things. So I think it's that um, truly uh, welcoming uh, people and treating each other uh, in a way that we seem quite happy to treat you know, other people that we serve in the community. Uh, so to me, that's that's sort of what it's about. Um, it's it's about you know truly treating people as equals when they're there next to us or, or or trying to be within us, not just the people who are other and out there waiting to be served by us through our good works. That's that's sort of how I how I feel it is. And and there's of course nothing remotely new in the idea that the church walks with marginalised people. I mean, Jesus was radical in his embrace of those shunned by his own society. Mm -hmm. If we look at the earliest church, it was a community that simply welcomed believers, and many of whom were not born into the yep. faith, not part yep. of the group. Do you think the Australian church needs to pay more heed to how practically and genuinely, as you're just saying, we walk with marginalised people where and when we find them, not out there in the abstract? Mm -hmm. the yep. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's back to basics, you know. Uh, who do we dine with? you know, um, who, who is at our table. Um, it, it's not just about going out there and finding some people who are, you know, oppressed, who we can show some sort of largesse to. Um, it, it's, it's who are we treating as our family and our friends? You know, who, who are we welcoming to dine with us? That's, and, and that is back to basics. That's the stories that you grow up with as a child during your sacrament preparation. It's about you know, Jesus modelling that welcome in terms of who he chose to invite into his life and, and to his table. Mm, yeah, and, and the table, as someone said just last night, could resemble one flew over the cuckoo's nest. <laughs> it's, it's this wild, rich diversity of people from every different background, every different walk of life in all yeah. their wonderful, rich human brokenness. And uh, that can be very challenging for us as church, can't it? Yeah, un unfortunately, it, it does seem to be dif difficult for so many people um, when you just sort of think, oh, how could it be that hard? Like, keep it simple, back to basics. Like, the, the message is there. It should be pretty obvious. It's, it shouldn't be that hard. Um, but people put up all these all these barriers. Uh, and then they complain why there's, there's no one there in the pews. It's like, well, because you're only counting this extremely narrow band of people that you feel are allowed to be there um, and that doesn't include um, you know LGBTIQA plus people it doesn't include people who are divorced uh, people who are divorced and remarried you know um, single mums there's a whole lot of people that you know you choose not to include and don't count and then bemoan the fact that people aren't there <laughs> yeah it, does, it kind of it's doesn't work out. really you know, yeah, any organisation, there's a whole lot of people we won't let join in. And it's curious that there aren't more yep, people yep, inside. Yep. Claire, great to talk to you. We'll bring you back for the questions shortly. Thank you so Thanks. much. Let's go to our panel now.
Benjamin O oh is with us. Benjamin's the founder and co-chair of Rainbow Catholics Interagency Australia. That's the umbrella body for Catholic LGBTIQA plus ministries in Australia. And he was the founding secretary of the Global Network of Rainbow Catholics. Dr. Judith Norris is a lecturer and researcher at the Australian Catholic University. She identifies as LGBTQIA plus with a support role for students and staff within this community right across the university sector in the ACT. Um, ben, oh, I'll, I'll start with you. Framing this within a, a long and often exceptionally difficult history within the church for LGBTQIA plus people inside and outside the church organisation, to the best of your knowledge, was anyone who identifies themselves as an LGBTQIA plus Catholic a member of the council? Thank you. Thank you, Genevieve. Thank you for having me here. I just want to acknowledge the, um, the Gardigal land on which I live and I work and the land that nourishes me, um, land that's never been ceded. Uh, it's a very, very important question because we, um, in the interagency, um, we know that parishes and Catholic communities um, have made lots and lots of submissions and many of them set forward on their submissions to us at the interagency calling for the inclusion of LGBTIQ organizers, Catholic ministries to be included. And in fact, one of them, you know, specifically call one of the asks from um, a symposium that we held in 2020, which is a national LGBTIQ Catholic affirming ministry symposium. One of the clear call um, was to have an inclusion of LGBTIQ Catholic organizers in ministry to be a part of the conversation. And as far as we know, no, not a single visible organizer. Yeah. So, so not a person who identifies thus, not a ministry that works with people in your community, literally. No, right. no. I mean, um, one of the one of the one of the organization that's part of the interagency's work, it's acceptance. Acceptance have been around for 50 years this year. And um, in fact, it's the second oldest, if we, to our knowledge, LGBTIQ Catholic affirming ministry, affirming Catholic ministry in the world. Um, you know, it's um, it says a lot um, who we intentionally include and who we intentionally leave out. Mm. Yeah, and, and Judith, to you, I mean, this exclusion is not because there aren't any LGBTQIA plus Catholics, obviously. Um, what, what need is there to find and affirm role models who are committed Catholics, who identify as LGBTQIA plus, to both minimise risk of harm for our young people, and also to find pathways for leadership, the, the visibility we've often spoken about throughout this tracker process? Yeah, thanks Genevieve, and a very good question too. And thank you very much for um, inviting me to be here tonight in Yarra Lundi. I'm on Ngunnawal land, and I pay respects to elders past and present. Um, well, ro <laughs> I, that role, role models would be there if they probably didn't um, have fear, uh, particularly those probably older, older people, my generation. <laughs> And more often than not, they're employed in Catholic agencies. And that's a bit of a bind in itself because their employment would be um, put at risk, particularly in Catholic education with leaders um, in Catholic schools. So, um, so that's difficult. I think um, we also need to remember our families in this space. There would, I'm sure there would be people um, uh, members of the plenary council who are parents, um, who have children, who identify. So, um, so it's it's just not those who identify. Um, it's a it's a it's a hurt, uh, I think, for families who've been in the church and their own children aren't recognised. They rec and they know that those children won't come back to church because they don't feel included. Um, and so that's been a, I think that's a really difficult thing. So in terms of role models and being Catholic, um, I think that's really important for our young people, um, particularly in our schools, that they can see that there are people who will support them and but have also walked that journey and <clears throat> allies, yes, but also those who do identify and that they can be open 
But in our Catholic schools, that's not possible. At our Australian Catholic University, it happens to be possible. And we're making um, some great grounds in that space where we have, we're starting to have strong ally networks. And that's really important for our students. However, our younger people, I think that that's a great threat for them if they don't have role models. Mm. Dean, as you said a moment ago, LGBTQIA plus Catholics have spoken out. The community held a symposium in 2020 and a letter was sent to the bishops, among others, along with a recommended pastoral guideline and a plenary submission, urgently asking for an end to what the letter called spiritual abuse, structural violence and discrimination. Have you seen action on this? Are, are you hopeful about an outcome? If I'm to be incredibly frank, I, I don't know what to expect of the Plenary Council when it comes to the LGBTIQ, when it comes to the care of LGBTIQ Catholics. Um, I mean, there's such a long history of duplicitous speaking, you know, double speak of um, you know, I'm just thinking about Catholic Uni Australian Catholic University, Notre Dame University, colleagues of mine who push for years and years just to have an LGBTIQ Catholic society club, and they couldn't even have that. The university denied them from having that. And I I'm, I'm very grateful and glad that things are moving slowly, but this is very recent. These are, some of these things are very recent, but from a hierarchical institutional perspective, there are things that are still not reversed. Um, you know, this month marks the 35, 35th anniversary of what LGBTIQ Catholics call the Halloween document, a document that came out from um, uh, the CDF, the Congregation of Doctrine, Doctrine of the Faith, um, you know, what we know as the Holy Office, the Holy Office of the Inquisition, right? Um, that letter, so-called pastoral letter was addressed to the bishops of the Catholic Church on the pastoral care of homosexual persons. In that letter, it, it wrote there that we are, um, uh, we are intrinsically disordered and we are ordered towards an intrinsic moral evil. Mm. And hence, because of that, any support for organizations, ministries to read LGBTIQ Catholics will be drawn since then. And that impact, it's still felt to today. It never ended. Mm -hmm. um, now, by the way, just to say that pastoral letter wasn't addressed to us, it was addressed to the bishops. Mm -hmm. and, and that impact um, reverberated from the 1980s, so 1986 to the height of the HIV epidemic. Um, mind you, since then, um, 1973, you know, where um, homosexuality was delisted as a mental health disorder with the, with the, with the, with the American Psychiatry, uh, Psychology Association. And then in 1990s, World Health Organization delisted that as well. Um, you know, things have moved on and science are, is speaking so clearly on, on, on some of these issues, um, but we are completely behind. And not just that, we are still not I mean, if you use, I mean, saying that ramifications is one way, I think the real biblical term, it's we haven't repented. Mm. We haven't atoned. We haven't even said sorry for the wrongs done to LGBTIQ people. Um, so, I mean, in, in 2016, for example, Pope Francis, said, Pope Francis said to Christians that we must apologize to gay people for the wrongs that have been done to them. We heard crickets. Yeah. So, I mean, there are, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know what to make of it. I've known of bishops who have said things like we have to welcome, um, 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 we, we welcome um, LGBT people. And then, not far down the track, goes on to publicly campaign against their civil rights and say horrendous things, you know. So, you know, this, I, you know, I don't know. I don't know what to make of it. I can only pray. And, and I have to say, like all LGBTIQ Catholics, and sometimes I have to pinch myself that there are still LGBTIQ Catholics working in the church. We, we, we have to keep doing what we do because it's life-saving work. Mm. Um, ask LGBTIQ folks how many friends they have seen suffered, um, mental health-wise or suicided. That, that's, that's our reality. Mm. 
Mm. And, and Ben, it's, it's absolutely palpable how painful this is for you. And thank you for speaking with such, with such passion and such dignity about this situation. The words like ordered towards an intrinsic moral evil, objectively disordered, are extraordinarily powerful and potentially very, very harmful words. But as you say, typical of language, still quite commonly heard within the church, despite mm. requests for that kind of language to be revoked or revised in light of a, a much more considered understanding of diversity within the community. But this attitude is, I guess, not being addressed by the plenary council? No, no, and I, and I suppose, I mean, one of the one of the one of the most glaring thing it's it's within the working the working document, like it's like it's all been edited out, and and it's all been removed uh, or sanitized. Um, it's 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 erasure, right? But this is the norm. This is the norm in our church. We don't exist, mm -hmm. um, and and our reality don't exist. Our stories don't exist. My children don't exist. My loving relationship of 16 years with my spouse don't exist. You know, that, that's, that's violence at, the, at its very core. And I just want to say, I know that things in Australia might have evolved a bit, not for the church perhaps, but that language of, of, of disorder and moral evil, it's oxygen, oxygenated in countries where they continue to criminalize and, 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 and maim LGBTIQ people. In our region, our neighbors still have laws who actually actively prosecute um, LGBT people. Mm -hmm. um, and our church um, supply some of that language. It's, it's consequential what we do. Judith, it's consequential in many ways. As, as you mentioned a moment ago, the church is a huge employer. So this attitude continues to seep into employment practices. Talk to me about what needs to be done about that and the practical ways the church can actually be, well, it's, it's not inclusive because you are church, church is for all of humanity, but, but how practically can the church support students, staff, colleagues who would identify as LGBTQIA+. Yeah, um, thanks Genevieve. There's a couple of, I, I think there are a couple of um, different spaces and that is, um, and that will be in our Catholic schools um, because they're a church for our young people. Um, and then we have our parishes. And, and so I think there can be, I really do think, and I do a call out to our Catholic school teachers here, or teachers mm. in Catholic schools, my big call out to them. I have a daughter in a Catholic school still, and, um, and she's been there since kindy, and I always wanted to make sure she went to a Catholic school because of um, our family religious beliefs. Um, and certainly her parents have been very accepted um, in terms of her family and I think they wear it as a badge of honour our Catholic school teachers but they beat a different drum to hierarchical and institutional church so much so that there's a secrecy mm. I would think a secrecy perhaps not so much in the metro areas because um, you know you can uh, there are a lot of people there but certainly in rural areas that's a uh, a really big and that's where I've taught mostly in rural areas and um, so Catholic school teachers are doing wonderful things with our young people particularly our teenagers and there are support groups in most of those Catholic schools but I also know that um, principals have um, they don't overtly they wouldn't overtly talk about that to say whoever the um, pastoral cleric is attached to that school. So they're doing really great things, but when things come into the public space, such as marriage equality, such as the Mark Latham promoting that bill, what comes out from, uh, from a, an ecclesial church teach, teaching point of view is that the students here, here who identify, hear that as negative towards them. And they, so, they immediately just go back in under their shell and yet they can see that they're really well supported in Catholic schools. So I think really great things are happening there. But I, but I also think that um, whoever you know, the former leaders are of the church, that they need to understand that they're doing, the Catholic school teachers are doing a most wonderful job and they probably are the role models 
in terms of this space for our young people because they come away from U12 where they accept all diversities and, uh, and they know that also that they're accepted. So that's one thing. I think that's a great thing that's happening. I think in parish life, um, but, but then again, <laughs> any Catholic teacher that identifies, they have to hide and, and, and live in secret. And I mean, that's been my um, working life experience because I've been in Catholic schools for many years. So that, that's deceit and that's just, that's just a, that's a really, um, really poor space. Um, and you know, I, st I know Catholic teachers who identify, and it's and it's and they stay there. And the, I mean, I stay in the church, and we do it for our faith and our reasons. And that you can do both, and that's I guess what I'd like to see in parish ways forward to help people who identify, whatever the they are, where wherever they sit, you know, LGBTQIA plus to help people irrespective of their age or demographic to help them manage the challenges of what Ben's just talking about to be able to um, have place for faith fusion and identity mm. their identity sexual identity um, to be able to have a place to be able to have people who can help us help us in that space help our young people in that space because we can do both. We, you know, we don't have to go, oh, well, that's my sexuality, I have to leave the church. It shouldn't be like that. Let's, let's go now to questions from our audience. Um, Tracy McEwen's standing by, sifting through the queries that have come through the Q&A function. Tracy, what are people asking about with, with what's turned into, I think, a very powerful conversation this evening? Thanks so much, Genevieve. It's really interesting hear, hearing you talk because I can hear the crossovers from from last night and and one of the things that was called out last night was the hypocrisy of the church and how how young people um, sniff out hypocrisy and so the church needs to be extra credible in in when when it comes to inclusion because it's going to be very difficult to have young children come into a church where they they can see you know from a distance that um, equality isn't recognised and one of the questions kind of reflects this and it, it's acknowledging the the church's refusal well they call it the elephant in the room in the question that there is so many um, the large numbers of gay priests bishops and religious men and women and other members of the hierarchy in both in Australia and worldwide. Um, that identifies as LGBTIQ+. Plus. And is it time, the question is, is the time, is it time for the church to come out of the closet? Judith, did you want to um, just reflect on that? <laughs> oh, yes, it'd be lovely if they all did, wouldn't it? <laughs> I wouldn't feel so lonely. <laughs> um, well, Yes, and, 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 and we know, I mean, what, what that person is saying, I'll validate that. Um, I would like to out some people, but I would, certainly wouldn't do it because I would <laughs> like to be outed and respect for people and all of those things. And it must be very difficult for the clergy in that space and our religious sisters and brothers. Um, is that what the question was asking? <laughs> yeah, I, I, but it I'm, not, I'm not really. I'm not really sure what it was. Whether that was asking, but there was another question along on similar lines, Judith. And what it was saying is that there are so many, like you, um, you all have been saying, there are so many wonderful people um, who identify as LGBTQIA plus in different ministries in the church, and they're they're hiding away. And yeah. when when is the church going to recognise that as a gross injustice? Mm -hmm. um, and and what's going to happen? Like, what does the church think is going to happen if the plenary council doesn't produce any real change in this area? Claire, did you want to comment on that? Yeah, um, I guess I'd I'd say a few things. Um, 
I think on sort of the point that was asked and that you sort of just mentioned then as well, Tracy, about uh, you know people who who don't feel they can identify, including perhaps those in the clergy, etc. I think um, my sense that uh, is that it, I, I didn't experience anyone sort of uh, identifying um, as LGBTIQA plus during the, during the plenary. I, um, um, and I'm not entirely sure it would have felt like a safe space to do mm. that. Yeah. Um, I, I, I can see and I would like to think that that might be different possibly come the second assembly when we're together in person. I think when people are isolated in their bedrooms with the chat function, the only way people can interact with them, that's that's different. There was some very personal sharing and certainly people sharing about uh, you know, family and friends and the sort of pain that they're bringing to the plenary council from the, the exclusion um, and abuse those people have, have suffered. Um, I think there has been uh, some talk on uh, the church more generally learning from, for example, uh, agencies. Uh, I know myself uh, through uh, my work uh, at, at Vinnie's um, people, staff members and members, you know, approaching me and saying, look, I, I do feel part of church. I, I do identify as, as Catholic. I don't go to church anymore because mm -hmm. I'm in, um, you know, a sex, a same sex relationship or um, I, you know, identify as a way that, that makes me feel excluded from, uh, from, from the, the church and from the mass. Um, but I, I do feel that I, find a, a home and, and can be myself within, you know, in their case, Vinnie's. Um, we're by no means perfect um, and a lot of our other agencies would be the same, but there are people who do um, consider themselves church and part of church um, and Catholic. They're not at mass for this particular reason, um, but they do find a home elsewhere. So there has been a lot of discussion around, well, those people are part of church, but what can the institutional church and you know the the, the parish and the the people that kind of decide who's welcoming those pews? What can they learn from uh, other agencies and and those sorts of things? So there's been a bit of discussion um, around that. Um, you know, I, I see sort of signs of of hope, um, and that there are things that uh, the church more generally can learn, and that there are some helpful sort of discussions through this plenary process. Um, but I do still think we're, there's a long way to go. And I would say one of the things that has come up is, you know, following the the very difficult you know, discussions and, and reflections on Thursday around um, abuse, which um, in particular on the child sex abuse, there were lots of people asking the sort of question of, well, have we really learned, given that we are still abusing people and inflicting so much pain on people uh, through our exclusionary practices, um, through the way that we um, are, are treating people, um, and and that that includes uh, LGBTQIA plus people, but also, for example, uh, women in abusive relationships who uh, don't feel they can leave their marriages, for example, because of the church's teaching. So there were a few discussions around that sort of thing, around have we really learned anything given that we are still traumatising uh, people in in different ways. I'm not sure right. if that answered your question, Tracy, <laughs> but th those are the things that came to mind hearing those last few comments and questions. Thanks thanks so much, Claire. And the, the, the pain is a lot of comments are coming through into the Q&A about how palatable the pain is and really acknowledging Judith and Benjamin, your sharing here tonight. So, you know, thank you so much for that. One of the um, one of the a couple of the questions that are coming through around around this point, and um, you know how heartbreaking it is to hear you know these stories, and um, and also distressing to hear that they're not being addressed in the plenary council as such, and and addressed head on. Like you know, it's it's a bit, you know, there's lots of things hidden in that agenda that that aren't necessarily faced head on. Um, but the question is, is canon law the main problem here? Um, or or is, is this a type of gendered violence that we're experiencing from more conservative Catholics? You know, what 
where where does the problem lie? Benjamin, did you want to like you know have have a go at um, addressing that for us? Yes, I think um, I want I want to quick 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 I'm echoing what Judith was saying about Catholic teachers, educators, or, or educators in our Catholic systems, and actually good clergy who are working under the radar to actually do some of this work. Good Catholic allies, Catholic leaders, ordained and not ordained. I mean, the interagency brings together a whole lot of people who cannot be out about doing their ministry. That's why we have to have this space to be able to do it safely. I mean, that's, I mean, interagency, it's a mode of function for the domestic violence um, um, reality. That's how bad things are. And I was thinking about earlier the question to Claire about the pink elephant in the room, for example. <laughs> I mean, we have a violently don't ask, don't tell culture in our church. That's problem because it affects our entire integrity of what we preach, which is Jesus alive. I mean, we, we, we don't leave that out. I mean, how could we tell people to hide who they are and don't tell us just quietly be gay or be lesbian, just don't tell us. I mean, that is terrible. I mean, that is the very opposite of living a life of flourishing and ho holiness. I mean, the circular language would be integrity, right? I suppose. And I suppose, I mean, the, the, the thing that I also wanted to name in terms of when you mentioned asking about canon law as a form of remedy, I think it's one of them. And I think what the point of even the conversation on inclusion, I sometimes feel it's a, it's a bit of a smoke screen because the point of inclusion and diversity is to, to, to stop um, finally exclusion, inequality, abuse, vilification, violence against LGBTIQ people um, in our church and in our society. I mean, the end point is not inclusion and diversity, just as the point for people who are uh, just for women folk, for people of color, First Nations people, refugee, asylum seeker. Um, the end point is to look at the Jesus of the poor, the Jesus the poor. I mean, the end point is not inclusion and, 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 and diversity. You know, inclusion and diversity is just merely methods and ways to get there, just like canon law. Justice is what we are seeking. And the, and the destination, it's bringing about the, king, the kingdom of God, you know, the kingdom of equality and equality and human flourishing. I mean, that's the end point, you know? And, you know, one of the, when, when you name about hypocrisy, I mean, parishes don't dare to put it in their, in their bulletin or put a little rainbow welcome sign, not because the entire parish, I mean, there are increasing Catholic communities and parishes who are doing LGBTIQ outreach work. We know they work with us, but they don't dare to put it out there, not because some homophobe off the street is going to come and beat them up. They are worried about, you know, mocks of conservative, you know, anti-LGBTIQ Catholic policing them and reporting to the local bishop. And then bad things happen to the parish. You know, the parish priest suddenly, whatever. You know, I know this because I know parish churches who have been picketed with rosary and placards by other Catholics. You yeah. know, uh, schools, bishops who speak out for inclusion, you know, just to say that these are children, they get picketed and protested. I mean, we got to call it out. This yeah. is bullying, violence, intimidation that happens today in 2021. So, just, just um, th th I can hear your frustration there, Benjamin. I just sorry. wanted to finish with one last question to Judith. Um, there, this, th this question is, you know, we can't. In the plenary counts, we've heard so much about mission and and being missionary disciples and and going out there and and bringing in all these people who've who've left the church who who are on the margins. Um, uh, I guess th this question is saying, um, shouldn't we see these people who are out there on the margins as missionary disciples them themselves? You know, ha have we got it round, round the wrong way? I think they're asking. Yeah, and I heard on another web tracker, um, Tracy, someone saying, 
well, it's not about welcoming people back to the church, but it's about <laughs> us as church going to the people. Yeah. So, so possibly mm. it could be that. I do look. I I still want to draw upon what Claire talks about in her agency, and Ben just spoke about it as well. And that is the Catholic agencies and them being church and church for, um, and the staff that work there. And and it's this. I mean, that's where we might need to go. Is we need to go to the people, who we probably know might identify, but it's too fearful for them regarding employment. But that's their space that they want to be to be church. You know, the Catholic school teachers are to be church. The people who work at Vinnie's, the people who are in what app, I don't know, um, but um, so maybe we, I don't know whether we're missionaries or not. I do think it's important to come out though. I do know in our university, when I did, um, I had a lot of um, uh, leaders saying, now be mindful, and I just knew that I was on, they couldn't sack me um, just because of our particular agency. Um, so that was all I just wanted to keep my job and um, but doing so there was so I, I just had so many other people across our faculty come out and feel comfortable to come out and say oh is it okay is it okay and then we you know in one of our campuses then we had a student group student staff group and um, and eventually, as Ben said, it took a long time, um, but we had the Ally Network. And it was done with campus ministry. Um, so I do know that when we ever do anything on one of our campuses that I'm involved in, I have campus ministry right next to my stall. <laughs> and I go and I do a lot of work before the market day or whatever, um, so that the conservatives, because we do have them, our conservatives don't say anything to our, please not to be mean or anything like that to any of our students and whoever's responsible around it can help and support us. And it's not all perfect, but we make inroads there. So thanks. Thanks so much, I, Judith. I I'm sorry. To have, <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry. I have to cut you short off there and okay. I'm just going to swing back to Genevieve and she's going to close for tonight. Thank you. Thanks so much. And thank you to Claire, to Benjamin and to Judith. Tomorrow night, we wrap up what's been a long week for some of the Plenary Council, and we'll try and make some sense of this historic, challenging, and deeply significant gathering for the Australian Church. I'll have a stellar cast of guests with me, Plenary Council member John Warhurst, historian Paul Collins, and broadcaster Geraldine Doog. Thanks for joining us tonight. I look forward very much to seeing you for our final Plenary Tracker tomorrow at 7.30.